Welcome to everybody who is here at the church with us today, and uh, those of you who are joining us via Facebook Live, we welcome you to our time of worship, and uh, it's a pleasure to, to have you here uh, with us. I'd like to just open us up with a word of prayer, if I may. Heavenly Father, as we get started into the preaching segment of and teaching portion of the worship, we just pray that you'd give us eyes to see and ears to hear your message for us today. And I pray that you would uh, be with me as I preach the word and present that, that I would do, in a, do so in a way that is honorable to you. In Jesus' name, we pray and ask these things. Amen. Have you ever met someone who it just seemed like it was impossible to please them? You know what I'm talking about? I heard somebody say yes. Uh, I heard a story about a large dog that walks into a butcher shop, right? And he's carrying a purse in his mouth and he puts that purse down on the front uh, of the meat case. And the, the butcher jokingly asks him, what is it, boy? And do you want to buy some meat? And the, and the dog goes, woof, right? And uh, the butcher says, hmm, well, what kind of meat would you like? Liver, bacon, steak, woof. The dog interrupts him with another bark. And, uh, and so then he asks, well, how much steak? Half a pound, a pound? Woof! So he's, okay. The amazed butcher, he, he, he gets a pound of steak and he wraps up that meat and he finds the money in the dog's purse. Well, as the dog leaves, a man is waiting in line and he's watching this, this whole thing unfold, right? And he decides he wants to learn more about this dog. So he follows the dog out of the butcher shop and the dog goes down the street and enters into an apartment house. He climbs up to the third floor, and he begins scratching at a door. Well, with that, the door swings open, and an angry man starts shouting at the dog. The man who followed that dog home, he yells, Whoa, wait, stop. You know, this is the most intelligent animal I've ever seen. And the dog's owner goes, Intelligent? This is the third time this week he's forgotten his key. You ever feel like that guy who followed the dog home? You know, you see something amazing, right? And, and it's met with less than an enthusiastic and even an unthankful response by others. Or maybe you can relate more to the dog owner, right? You've got this dog that can go out and buy groceries for you and bring them back home. But then instead of seeing that, all you see is the fact that he forgot his key again. It's sometimes difficult to live in a world that seems often so ungrateful. As we enter into this season of Thanksgiving 2020, we're going to spend some time talking about gratitude. And today I begin a new message series called Gratitude, Living a Life of Thanksgiving, or a Life of Thankfulness. And, uh, you know, we just finished this election cycle, right? Half the country is rejoicing over the outcome. The other half is kind of just stewing over it. And, and maybe for that half of the nation, it's kind of hard for them to be thankful and grateful right now. But think about this, too. As, you know, as we continue slogging our way through COVID-19 in this season of hardship, with cases continuing to increase now, uh, maybe it just seems more difficult to be thankful this year. And so I think it really is a good idea for us to, to look at this topic and be intentional about living as a people of gratitude, right? I, I'm, in the month of November, we're going to be focusing on that. What does it mean to be a people of gratitude? What does it mean to live with thankfulness? Well, gratitude is a fundamental key to having a deep and satisfying and meaningful life. We understand that you know, work and play and community and our home and our investments and even our service to others, all these things can add value to our lives, adding satisfaction and meaning maybe. But still, there are many people who have all of these things in their life and yet they are still hopeless. They still walk around as if their life has no meaning or purpose. And I would propose that if I want my life to be significant, and if you want your life to be significant, one of the most important keys to gaining meaning is to live my life and for you to live your life with gratitude. Gratitude just has a way of putting things into our, 
into proper perspective for us. Through gratitude, we appreciate life's goodness, which maybe compels us to pay it forward to others. Gratitude creates within us this deep sense of happiness and satisfaction, which in in turn enriches our relationships with family, and it nurtures our friendships, and it and it makes living in our community and in our culture more pleasant. But what exactly is gratitude? Gratitude is remembering and expressing thanks for the grace and goodness bestowed on our lives. That's what gratitude is. And it's so easy to start taking things for granted, isn't it? I mean, maybe think of your attitude before COVID hit in last March, right? And it got really bad. A lot of things we took for granted, jobs, family, you know, being able to get together. All of a sudden, when we can't do that anymore, we don't quite take that uh, as much for granted. Well, it's easy to start doing that, though. But gratitude reminds us that someone is doing something for us that we don't deserve. We didn't earn the benefit, and yet we're still receiving it. One of the things that was most touching for me to see when we were doing the Trunk or Treat event on Halloween was hearing all those kids as they'd go through the lines and they'd get their candy, and then they would express their thankfulness to us uh, as they put that candy in their buckets or in their bags. And I'm so glad that we were able to do that for our community. And thank you to each of you who helped us to, to make that possible, who blessed people. You know, maybe you were passing out candy or you'd You dressed up or you decorated your vehicle. And, uh, you know, we had way more families and kids than I thought we were going to have. We had to, we were kind of like at the last minute going out and getting more candy and stuff. Thank you to those of you who did that because I don't know what we would have done otherwise. But it all worked out. And, uh, you know, I can remember a month earlier in September, our board was debating should we do this or not? You know, is, is this a good idea? Wondering if we should hold that event in light of the COVID pandemic. But I'm glad we were able to do it. And so many children came out, and almost all of them expressed thanks. And if they forgot, well, there was a parent behind them who would ask then, what do you say? And the little kid would say, thank you, right? (laughs) There's something significant about having gratitude. It, It keeps you from becoming arrogant. It reminds you that we are recipients of grace. It says to us that not all good things that happen to us are because of our effort. And so gratitude is remembering and expressing thanks for the grace and goodness bestowed on our lives. Gratitude chooses to focus on grace and goodness in our life instead of focusing on loss and what we wish we had but don't. Early in the Bible, we see one of the first acts of gratitude expressed by Noah when Noah worshipped God. In fact, Noah expressed gratitude for God's goodness through worship. We see this in Genesis chapter 8. Open up your Bible or your smartphone to Genesis chapter 8, And I want to read for us right now verses 15 through 20. Genesis 8, verses 15 through 20. It says, Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, all the creatures that move along the ground, so that they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. And so Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives and all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds and everything that moves on land came out of the ark, one kind after another. And then Noah built an altar. And this is what I want us to really see here. Verse 20, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. So after being on this ark for approximately a full year, Noah walks off the boat, and then Noah builds an altar to worship the Lord. Noah's first recorded act upon leaving the ark was an act of gratitude, and he worships God. It's easy to read over this act of worship and miss what's happening here. Without a close reading and intentionally seeing it, it appears to just be the simple practice of, you know, offering up some more sacrifices. 
But really, this is an extraordinary act of thankfulness. It's an extraordinary act of gratitude to God for their provision and safekeeping through that year. And when we consider the fact that Noah spent a whole year on the ark and that out of all the things he could have done first, he makes a conscious decision to say thank you to the Lord, that's even kind of astounding in and of itself. Build houses first? No. Build a temple first? No. Build a grocery store in 7-Eleven first? Not a... (laughs) As he walks off the plank after a year of being cooped up on that huge ship, Noah makes this conscious decision that the very first thing he's going to do is say, thank you to God. That's powerful when you stop and think about it. From what we can see in Scripture, God did not direct him to do that. He just did it because it was part of his core values as a person. Noah didn't offer a sacrifice out of the need to have good fortune from the gods like, you know, other ancient Near Eastern people used to do. He didn't do it out of a desire to keep God happy or to appease him somehow so that he could get on God's good side. No, he offered a sacrifice out of heartfelt gratitude. His natural inclination upon leaving that huge ship was to say, thank you. And in Genesis 8, verse 21 through 9, verse 1, we read that God responded kindly to Noah's act of gratitude. God, who knew Noah's heart, understood that Noah, leaving that ship and offering a sacrifice, it it was really more than just a sacrifice. It was an expression of Noah's true gratefulness. And so Noah, he worshipped God, and God blessed Noah. In fact, God promised the whole world that he would never flood the world again, that we would always remember that by putting something in the sky. What was that? The rainbow, right? And every time we see the rainbow, it is God's reminder to us that he will never destroy the earth like that again. God's goodness is powerful, and we need to receive that with a grateful heart by giving him our worship. Blessing Noah was not a response to anything Noah had earned His blessing wasn't because he was some stellar ship captain, you know, who kept the morale of his crew in high spirits, nor for having completed the ark according to God's building codes, nor was it a reward for his exceptional care of God's last remaining creatures on earth, because Noah's heart was thankful. His emotion overflowed into this act of worshipful gratitude. And isn't that why we worship God today still? We also express our gratitude for God's goodness through our worship. It shapes our outlook on life. It impacts our attitude for good. Well, not only did Noah express gratitude for God's goodness, but the Israelites did later as well. The Israelites expressed thanks for God's goodness and love. And this comes out in Psalm 118, verse 1. You know, many of the Psalms were written to express their thanks to God for his goodness and love. And so, for instance, we have this Psalm 118, verse 1. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. King David wrote that as a song to express his gratitude for God's protection from Israel's enemies and to thank God for his provision by providing for all of their needs. And David recites different ways in that psalm in which God has been good to them as he sings throughout. And the psalm ends as it begins. Verse 29 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures what? Forever. His love endures forever. You know, it was probably this psalm they would have been singing as they processed back to the temple to worship God after he had brought them back home after their exile in Babylon. I don't know if you know much of the Jewish history, but in 586 B.C., the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, and they destroyed the temple, and they tore down the the walls, and the temple was completely flattened that King Solomon had built. And the Babylonian invasion killed thousands of Jews, and it captured, captured many thousands more who were then taken out of Jerusalem and all the way back to Babylon to become slaves. But 70 years later, the Persian king named Cyrus began letting 
Some of those exiles returned to Jerusalem, and they did. And in 516 B.C., the temple in Jerusalem was rebuilt. The only problem was the people weren't worshiping as they should. So nearly 60 years later after that, a prophet by the name of Ezra, and a priest he is, he is able to head back home to Jerusalem with some more exiled people. And in 458 B.C., about 120 years after they had been taken to exile, Ezra is the one who gets that priesthood and worship back in order again. And as the people are rededicating themselves to worship the Lord with all their heart, no doubt they would have been singing Psalm 118, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Say it with me. His love endures forever. The Jewish nation was getting another chance from the Lord to return to their homeland and to restore their worship of God in the holy city of Jerusalem. And they're grateful. And the Israelites expressed thanks for God's goodness and love. They had lived through times of pain and suffering, but the Lord had preserved them. He had kept them. He had watched over them as they returned safely home And they say thank you to God. It is important to say thank you when we receive goodness and love. Saying thank you helps us to have gratitude in our core. Saying thank you helps us to stay focused on what's good in our life. It reminds us that we are loved. When you're down and discouraged and you read this psalm, you are reminded that the Lord is good. His mercy is unending. And in spite of what you're going through, you and I, we need to give thanks to the Lord. It's while thanking God that we realize how blessed we really are. It is in thanking God that we can take time to count our blessings. I want to encourage you and challenge you to do that through this month of November. Every day, look for how God is blessing you. Maybe count five blessings each day to see what God is doing in your life. Because it's easy to take those things for granted, isn't it? It's easy to forget God's goodness. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. And the Israelites expressed thanks for God's goodness and love. And we can do that too. Well, we've seen today how Noah expressed gratitude for God's goodness through his worship. And we saw how the Israelites expressed thanks for God's goodness and love. And I guess what I'm really trying to say today is that gratitude reminds me of God's grace and that I am loved. It reminds me of his grace and that I am loved. When I'm grateful in my core, I get the most out of the time spent worshiping God. That's when, that's when your worship of God becomes more than just something rote that you do or becomes something that's boring that you got to sit through. When gratefulness is in your core, worshiping God becomes more special. When I recognize goodness and love that is given me, I am quick to say, thank you. Gratitude reminds me of God's grace and that I am loved. And that's when I start living a life of thankfulness. That's when you will too. Psalm 51, verses 15 through 17. Open up your Bible or your smartphone to that. Psalm 51, verses 15 through 17 says, Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, O God, will not despise. There is something about gratitude that makes us humble before the Lord, that reminds us of who we are and who he is. When David wrote this psalm, he was repenting of his sexual sin committed against Bathsheba and her husband. He saw clearly that he was guilty of doing something horrible. And when there is nothing else he can do except to apologize and repent of his sin, his gratitude for God's grace and love touched him to the core. He was forever, for the rest of his days, grateful for God's love and forgiveness in his life. And he was forever thankful for the Messiah who would come in the person of Jesus. 
and die on that cross as the sacrifice for our sins and then resurrect from the dead to prove to us that we are good with God. You know, had he not resurrected from the dead, we would not be good with God. But we know that we are. And so gratitude just reminds me of God's grace and that I am loved. This past October, October 14th to be exact, down in Atlantic City, New Jersey, I don't, I don't know if you saw this story in the news, but police officer Eric Nuttall's body cam video was released a couple of days after that, and it showed his heroic actions and words on the evening that he saved the life of a man who almost succeeded committing suicide by jumping off the ledge of a 13-story parking garage. Police officers were responding to a man who, when they got to the scene, he had already perched himself on the ledge and he was ready to jump. And he kept saying, no one loves me. No one cares if I die. No one will ever miss me. And later in an interview, the officer said this man's despair was painfully evident as he repeated those words over and over again. No one loves me. No one will miss me. No one cares if I die. Well, as other officers tried to talk him off the ledge, Eric realized the situation was getting worse, not better. And that the man on the ledge was going to jump. And so as the officer witnessed this man's pain, he said all he could think about at that moment was, I love this man and I care about him. And he ran towards that guy as hard as he could as he was preparing to jump and he grabbed onto his leg and he held onto his leg for all he was worth. And he yelled out to his fellow officers because he was getting ready to go over that building with this guy. Pull me back! Pull me back! You can hear him yelling that on the video. And as they did... He's hanging on to this guy who had started to jump, and he was able to pull that suicidal man off the ledge back to safety. As the man continued to vocalize his brokenness, he he was just weeping and crying. And he asked Eric Nuttall, he, he said, why didn't you just let me jump? And as Eric hugged him with both arms around the man on the rooftop that night, both arms around him, just hold them tightly, And this guy's asking, why didn't you just let me jump? Eric Nuttall said, I love you. You are loved. That's why. I love you. You are loved. That's why. Other officers came around them and put their arms on the man's shoulders and said, you're not alone. We care about you. And I got to tell you, It's kind of disturbing to watch that video. You can see it on YouTube, but it it is also extremely powerful as it reminds us that we are all loved by God like that. Every single one of us is loved by God like that. He goes out to the edge. He goes out on the ledge, and he pulls us back to him, and he hugs us with both arms, and he says, I love you. And when you are loved by God, You become grateful, and you just can't help but reach out with God's love to others in their time of need. You know, Officer Eric Nuttall would later tell reporters, I I just felt I loved him even though I didn't know him. He said, it broke my heart to see him feel so unloved. Because I am loved, I knew I loved him. And as the officer talked, the gentleman off the ledge Something deeply ingrained in his heart and in his mind inspired him to share what he felt in his own life. He was able to share grace because he had received grace. My friends, this is what happens when we have gratitude in our core. Because we know we are loved by God and we've been rescued by his grace. God's grace just pours out in expressions of love to those around us. And if you want to live a life of thankfulness that expresses God's love like this, then gratitude has to be at the core of your heart. Make gratitude a core value. Jesus reaches out right now to rescue those who will let him. You know, when he died on that cross, he took our place so we wouldn't have to be eternally condemned because of our sin. So that we wouldn't be eternally separated from our God because what we did violated him and went against his character and all that he stands for. And Jesus saves us. Let's be grateful for that. 
Gratitude is the foundation, right? It's the foundation to having a life that is rich, to having a life that is satisfying, to having a life that is full of meaning and purpose. And I know there are things we can complain about. (laughs) I wouldn't even ask you to raise your hands if you could complain about anything right now. I already know that we could complain about things. But let's choose to have gratitude in our core. And let's live a life of thankfulness because he is good and we are loved. He's good all the time, amen. And we are loved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love expressed to us. And we pray that you'd help us to live a grateful life, a meaningful life, a life that lives in the realities of your grace. And Father, I know that there are people here today or listening that are hurting. Something's going on in their life and it's hard and it's difficult. And yes, those things need to be addressed and they need to be worked through. But may they not be the center of our focus. Help us to see the good that you are doing and the good that you want us to do. That we would live lives of gratitude and lives of thankfulness. And as we leave here, may we leave with your favor and blessing on our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.